Tristan Tate selling a cigar. It's $350. Do you want this? I don't think it was very good. Here's why I don't think it was very good. But above all, the reason why a lot of people don't like people in sales profession is because of lack of from scratch to success from a faith-based and biblical perspective this is also your channel too as well how would you feel if you lost it all but you had the favor of one i don't care oh, I'm good. to see the hand of god work in patrick's life that's my prayer for you because when you please your creator you please your father you please the man upstairs he cannot resist but to shine down his blessing upon you What's crack a everybody? Money smart guy, Matt Zipali here. Healing to you from Dallas, Texas. And once again, we're back here for another episode of the Seven Figure Squad podcast here, episode 83. And just a heads up for our followers out there, we made a little bit of a pivot. And so uh, just make sure we set expectations from what you can expect from my podcast and YouTube channel here going forward. A lot of people have been asking for my reactions on certain topics, certain areas um and so we will be we'll be doing that going forward i'll also be doing a lot more topics here in these three key areas which is number one sales leadership not just sales sales leadership i went from building myself in a sales career where i'm just a we me myself and i top our operation to a five-man operation to a 10-man operation today we have a five thousand women and men operation across the country and so a lot of people are asking me how do i do, do i only get in sales but also how, how can I scale and build a team, build an organization, uh, duplicate myself in multiple offices across the country. And so that's what we'll be talking about on this channel too as well, not only just sales, but sales leadership. The second area is entrepreneurship and topics that help you build a business, help you think more entrepreneurial, understanding that capitalism is a great economic system that's given myself, yours truly, after 25 years in business, after spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in self-education, to come back to a YouTube channel that talks about the best areas to help you go from nowhere to somewhere, stud, uh, uh, from from dud to stud, and from from scratch to success. That's what entrepreneurship topics are. We're going to be talking about here on this channel. And last but not least, faith and finance. We're going to be talking about those topics too here on this podcast, as well as our overall YouTube channel, breaking down into different uh, uh, different separate episodes too, as well throughout the week. So I promise you, I'm going to give you my very best. And by the way, I just want to let you guys know, I've got nothing to sell you outside some T-shirts, outside some books. I don't have a. I don't have a. Uh, a, a course to sell you. I don't have a, a mentorship to sell you. Of course, a lot of people do ask me for that. Who knows? Down the road, there might be something that uh, might be appropriate, but I do that already. I mentor, I coach, I mastermind with people inside my organization, uh, the Money Smart Movement team here at PHP Agency. I do that already. So if people want to get a hold of me and, and get the best of what we do to build our organization for where it's at to where we're going from. So our job right now, uh, my job, my directive is to take our current business, which was valued Overall, not just myself, but our overall conglomerate organization of PHP agency of, th of a close to nearly a $300 million company. My job is to take that to a billion dollar company. And so therefore, I'm not talking to you from theory. I'm not talking to you from hope. I'm not talking to you from uh, uh, case studies of other people. I'm giving you my own case study of what I'm currently going through, what we've been through the last 25 years, well, how we've uh, built a company from zero to $300 million and so sold it to a company down here in downtown Dallas. Uh, what it's been like to be mentored by Patrick and David going on nine years now. Uh, we're going to get the very best of me to help you out in your current endeavors, in your sales, in your sales leadership, in terms of going from a sales person to a sales leader, to a business owner, to a CEO. You're going to get that here at the Seven Figure Squad. If you want to go from a just one-man operation to actually building a business where you're just not helping yourself, you're helping so many other people, you're creating jobs, you're making an impact in your community, you make a difference because you're creating uh, products and solutions that make other people's lives better. That's this channel. If you want to talk about finance from a faith-based and biblical perspective, this is also your channel too as well. Because uh, listen, God wants you to be prosperous. God, I'm not so sure if God wants to be a millionaire, but all I want to say is, by the way, to, to tell God that uh, you just want to be a millionaire, you're asking God for too little. So if you want to be prosperous, you want to be wealthy, you want to create generational wealth, that's what the channel is all about. And so that said, let's get into it. So sadly, sales has become a dirty little word, uh, but put simply, sales is the ability to help people meet a need for a solution or service that you provide. And well, at least ethical sales, that is. You know, we got a lot of people sadly out there. You know, when I was growing up in Chicago, I thought the sales guy, you know, 
right? The corner boys. He would make out. He'd be the sales guy. He'd have this lavish lifestyle. He would had money. He had a car. He had girls. He had parties, et cetera. But at what expense? So my framing of salespeople was where somebody wins, but yet sadly, somebody loses. And I think also in the dog eat dog world, also in, in entrepreneurship, there's gonna ha- you're gonna have that element in any business. You're gonna have that dog eat dog world anytime there's an opportunity to make money, to get a position of power, to, to, to accelerate, to advance above somebody else. Sadly, there's always gonna be that element of unethical practices, of distasteful uh, business uh, practices, and you just have to get over that part because just like there's bad doctors, there's also good doctors. Just like there's uh, bad restaurants, there's also good restaurants. Uh, just like there's bad theme parks, there's also good theme parks, right? So you just got to focus your attention on what is good and process and have the awareness to process what is not. So my team asked me to react to some videos here on sales. And the first one here is on Tristan Tate selling a cigar. So let's take a look at Tristan Tate selling a cigar. Would you say you still have the sales skills in you? Love to have a cigar right 100%. now. 100%. Yeah? If I went broke tomorrow, the, the problem is because I'm famous, the Tate brand in and of itself is worth so much. I couldn't go broke. If I went broke, I could make the money back somehow. Yeah. But I could start selling cigars or ties or something. Yeah. So if I told you right now, sell me a cigar, putting you on the spot. You're putting me on the spot to sell you this cigar? Yep. Okay, what's your experience with cigars? Do you like cigars? <sighs> Sometimes they can get to my throat a bit. And then uh, end up coughing or something like that. Well, that's that. your problem. That's because you've been buying the lower quality cigars. What's your typical budget when you purchase each stick? Mm, I think the most I've spent on a cigar is probably about 200 pounds. See, well, that's your problem right there because this cigar actually costs $350 per cigar. And the way that the tobacco is aged before they roll it is the key. The smoothness of the cigar comes not when you make it, not when you roll it, not when you put the label on it, but it's the process after picking the tobacco to, di- to drying it, flavoring it, spicing it, and aging it. And that's where the smoothness comes in, like a fine whiskey or a fine cognac. So what you need to do is smoke fewer cigars per week. Don't go for three or four at 100, 200 bucks each. Just treat yourself every Friday night to one of these. This is truly exceptional. The coughing will stop. The smoothness will be there. You'll notice a a greater enjoyment from your cigar cigar experience than you've ever enjoyed before. It's $350. Do you want this? Uh, I don't know, Justin. $350 seems a bit out of my budget, man. Well, you know what? If you can't afford it, that's perfectly fine because I have customers who can. And things like this, they don't stay on the market for very long. So this is definitely going to go if I put it in the humidor at the cigar store. So if you don't want to buy it, it's no problem for me. And you could stick to what you have and keep coughing. Keys have got to be right there. Light the cigar up. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, we can stop right there. All right, so how would you guys rate this sales pitch? Scale of 1 to 10. 10, very convincing. I want to buy a cigar or one. Still kicking tires. I don't know, man. Um, I would rate this, by the way, I like Tristan Tate. Uh, I, I like the Tate brand. I like what they stand for. Um, looking forward to an interview with them. But listen, let me p- do a little push, pushback. I don't think it was very good. Here's why I don't think it was very good. And I think the host was just being indulging, I guess, just absorbing it in because he's there with Tristan Tate. Obviously, it's, both the Tate brothers speak so well. They're so eloquent. They're so well-spoken. They're so well-read. And it's hard not to like them. So I think as a salesperson, one, one thing you got to realize is that you have to be put together because people, if you're in sales, if you're offering a product or service, you're asking for people's vote, you're asking for people, people's buy-in, you got to look the part. You got to look the part of being successful. You got to be well-groomed, you got to be well-dressed, well put together. And that's what the Tate brothers and what all the lot of successful salespeople that we've seen has done, has, they got that accomplished. You're, you're easier on the eye. You don't want your eye being a distract. You want your, your physical appearance to be a distraction or an objection to why people don't want to do business with you. Now, that being said, people may not like the way you look. They may not like the, the color of your skin, sadly. They may not like the way you sound. They may not like the words that come out your mouth. <laughs> That's okay. But all I'm saying is people, sadly, judge a book by its cover. Now, he mentioned there at the beginning, he said the Tate brand uh, helps him sell so much. In other words... If you want to sell more, guess what you should establish? A brand. You should establish some form of reputation that people know you and know of you. So therefore, when you're about to do business with them, they kind of get an understanding of how you do business anyway, and therefore, they're more inclined to say yes. Sadly, this also works the opposite way. Now, back to step one. If people are judging a book by its cover, you got to make a very nice cover. 
The second part of it is have your reputation precede you to make your sales process easier. The third part is now is understanding, I think Tristan missed this, is why does the guy want to sell cigars? Why does somebody want to buy life insurance? Why does somebody want to buy real estate? Why does somebody want to buy your hospital bed, et cetera, et cetera? Why does someone want to buy your product and service? So for me, the way I've accelerated my sales and sales leadership and helping other people get advanced in sales is helping people ask questions to discover the pain. And it just can't be superficial. You got to understand someone's pain and their desire for a product or service that they don't even know yet because they're willing to share with you their pain. And you just don't have the superficial one. I asked three, four, five deep the question, why? Three, four, five times based on the initial pain. For example, well, uh, the reason why I want to uh, consider buying life insurance because, uh, I don't know, I just want to make sure I'm doing the right thing, right? Well, why? Why is doing the right thing important to you? Well, you know, as an adult now, I think, uh, you know, my wife just kind of forced me into this thing and... Um, you know, I just, I just want to be financially responsible about car insurance about home insurance. I might as well buy, buy some life insurance. Great. So why is doing the right thing and listening to your wife important to you? Why? Well, you know, she's uh, brought it to me that uh, something never happened to me that uh, the financial, uh, financially speaking, our family would be out on a limb. We'd have to sell the house. We sell, sell the thing because I'm the primary bread earner. Exactly. So why is protecting the bread owner's income, the ability to provide for your family, why do you think that's important for you to consider having an insurance policy to make sure, Lord forbid, if something happens to you, you die too soon, you survive a heart attack, stroke, or cancer, why do you think life insurance with both living benefits and death benefits, why do you think that's important for you to replace your current income so therefore your family doesn't get exposed to financial difficulties? Huh, it's interesting. I never, I never thought about that. I never thought about that way. By the way, just keep doing that. Just keep doing that. You get them in a dialogue. You get people start talking and people don't think they're getting sold anymore. You know what people feel? They feel they're being educated. You, you feel like you're the person that knows them. I always say this in networking. Don't look to be interesting. Look to be interested. And people look at you differently. They don't look at you as a salesperson anymore. They look at you as a trusted advisor, somebody that can just not only do business with as a client, uh, in, in a client um, type of relationship, but somebody as a peer, as a colleague, as a friend. So let's go look at his brother, Andrew Tate, and how he talks about how to sell. And one of the areas here I think is very, very important here, because this is something I didn't have when I left the Marine Corps, is I didn't have this when I got involved in business, when I got involved in sales. Let's take a look at this clip. Sit in a room full of people who are making a bunch of money. Everyone understands this. Your network is your net worth. You are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. Everybody understands this. And then they still hang around with fucking losers, because they're dummies. You're right, I am the sum of the five people I spend the most time with. Anyway, this is my friend Nick. He's so funny when we go drinking because he gets really drunk. <laughs> Losers. I don't talk to anybody who is not winning. Everybody whose phone, uh, every phone call I will answer, if I answer a phone call, it is from a winner. I don't talk to losers. Everyone I talk to is rich. Everyone I talk to is making money. Everybody. If my entire reality is full of multimillionaires making money, how am I not going to make money? And this is why network is so important is because it's the same reason that wolves hunt in packs. If you're a lone animal, you have one set of eyes. But if you're a pack, you're watching every single angle, every single side. Perhaps I might miss something. I'm as perspicacious as possible. But one of my friends identifies that the war in Ukraine is going to change and the Russian ruble is going to pump. And you can make a bunch of money on a forex trade, for example. I may not have noticed, but he'll notice. Now I've made a bunch of million dollars to get a text message, right? Mm. Because I have friends who are paying attention. All of us are paying attention. So your network is super important. That's another thing. We'll go into this because I have something called the War Room, which is also on corporatetech.com. I let people read for themselves. But that's my private network. And we specifically talk about money. So there it is. Your network is your net worth. But what's the problem there? Everybody knows that. What's the problem, as Tristan has just said? The problem is that a lot of people are unwilling to get out of their comfort zone to be uncomfortable getting outside of your current friends and family that you grew up with, that you associated with, that you may have worked with. For example, when I was in the Marine Corps, do you think I knew a lot of rich people? Zero. Everybody was making fifteen, eighteen, twenty thousand dollars a year. Everybody, everyone in the office was broke. 
We talked to the guys that are higher up, staff sergeants, gunnery sergeants, even the lieutenants. They were broke. They had a little bit more money, though. They had a little bit better salary, but they were still broke. So just because people make a lot more money than you doesn't mean they're actually wealthy. Just because people make a lot more money than you on the outside doesn't mean they're actually depositing, keeping more money in the bank account or putting money into their investments, which is creating more assets and less liabilities. Doesn't mean that they're financially going to be creating generational wealth just because they make more money. You know, just this last week, we just came back from the NBA draft. One of our clients was um, a client of our associate because his father's one of our agents. And uh, son deals with him when he was in college, and now he's getting drafted into the pros. So shout out to Jalen Wells. Congratulations on getting drafted by the Memphis Grizzlies. And uh, Memphis is only about an hour, hour and a half away from us here from Dallas, so we look forward to seeing more and supporting your career as it continues to unfold. We're very, very excited about you. What a life experience. This doesn't happen. You know, the the reality to it is that there's approximately 25,000 uh, NCAA players that play basketball, of which 4,000 are draft eligible, of which only 56 to 60 ever get drafted by the NBA. The only reason why I say 56 to 60 is because if you saw this draft this year, it's been a French revolution. Can't tell you how many players just, just players from France got drafted into the NBA. The first two players overall in this, this year's 2024 NBA draft was from France. In the first two rounds, Of the second round, the first two players were from France and Spain, respectively. So, side note, there's a massive international movement of players getting drafted into the National Basketball Association. I think we'll fairly shortly here. There might be a league called the International Basketball Association because I think that's where the NBA is headed. So, um, with that being said, this agent, I asked his agent, how how does a NBA player an NBA player candidate, of all the players playing college, of all the players playing across the world in different leagues, how do they stick out? Obviously, talent's assumed. 40-inch vertical, whatever vertical you got is assumed. Points on the board is assumed. Your lead on the floor is assumed. But how does a player really stick out to a team that the team is willing to talk to an agent about that player, about potentially drafting them and bringing them on their roster? Talk here to Maurice an agent from PNW Sports Agency, and uh, this is what he said. Stick this up. Here with Maurice Johnson, agents. Maurice, what makes a player stand out to you guys and mark before you guys work with that, that particular athlete? Um, I think you kind of have to look between the lines, to be honest. Um, I think you have to look at the things that don't always stand out right away. Um, I think personality, who the kid actually is off the court, um, what he brings, his family, how he, where he comes from, the environment he's raised in, kind of how he carries himself. Um, a lot of these organizations, as well as a lot of companies these days, they treat this like a Fortune 500 thing. And so they're looking for somebody who can articulate themselves, who's very self-aware, knows themselves kind of in and out, and kind of also to represent them as well as the organization that they're kind of going for, obviously. So I think that's the main point. And also, when it comes to actually just drafting a player, um, a lot of people don't know that they have a lot of pre-draft interviews, um, a ton of pre-draft interviews. And so those, again, those questions can be um, from very standard to kind of off the wall. And so those answers will determine if the team does want to invest in them. you got to remember, it's, they're investing millions into these players. So they want somebody to count on accountability, dependability. And I think that's probably one of the main things. So think about that. Did he say uber talent? Did he say he can rain it from half court? Did he say slam dunk contest? Did he say three-point winner, uh, shooter winner, uh, three-point contest uh, winner? No, he didn't say none of that. Talents assumed. Character over everything. So if you're going to sell, yes, I'm going to encourage you. You better get on your sales skills. You better get on your prospecting and be on the phone and practicing your scripts and knowing your product. But above all, the reason why a lot of people don't like people in sales profession is because of lack of character that people feel that being hustled on that people feel that somebody isn't really there to assist them and help them and guess what a good being in sales and, and, and being a person that's in an ethical position of selling did you actually believe by selling your product or service you actually feel that deep down inside because you understand their situation that you feel your product or service is a solution to them having a better life and them having less problems by them acquiring either your idea, your ideals, your way of thinking, or your product or your service that you can sell it to them, they can buy, they can acquire it, 
that can possess it for themselves, if you genuinely feel that way because you're putting them through an education process by understanding their pain, well, guess what people want to do? It isn't about you selling it to them. It's them asking you more about what you do. And so when I was a rookie, that's how I sold. Tell, 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 pitch, 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 pitch. Brah. Like, threw up on people about benefits, features, price, comparisons, competitors. Blah. To me, that's important, yes, but that's after people buy you. You're the sales leader. You're the one leading the conversation. People better buy you. And how better would it be? Not only do they buy you, ethical, relatable, and you have, have a product that matches that character. And if you're that type of disposition, I've seen people that win loss scenario, but the best sales is win win scenario or win 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 scenario. Obviously, the customer wins uh, first is the priority. Then who, who wins? The sales person and then the vendor or the manufacturer creates that product. So therefore, they can continue drawing that revenue so they can create another generation of that product for the next launch and the next wave of when that product is going to be relaunched. I mean, think about this. How many iPhones have you owned? We're what, iPhone 15 now? But thankfully, because somebody sold you a product that you bought into, they continue to add value to. Guess what you started to do? Many people started to do. Get the next phone, get the next phone, get the next phone. Don't you really need to uh, understand the features and benefits of the last phone, but they got the new one anyway, just get the, for sake of getting a new phone. So when you're looking at these things, yes, network is your net worth. Your income and your wealth is dedicated upon the people you surround yourself with. And, and guess what you got to do too as well? You got to start detaching yourself from people that you love, that you care about, that may not be willing to get to the next level. Still loving your friends, still loving your family. Yes, they'll always be friends, they'll always be family. But from a peer standpoint, from a running mate standpoint, from somebody getting to the next level standpoint, that's where you got to develop new friends, new family members to add to that circle. Speaking of which, let's talk about entrepreneurship. What is entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship is the ability of creating a solution to a problem by leveraging a team to execute it. And if you do this right, the business should run without you. That you don't have to be the ones always pushing the buttons. You allow your business to enjoy your life while your team handles the day to day. I'm reminded of this book called The E Myth, written by Michael Gerber. And he talks about the three different uh, people that show up to a company. One's the entrepreneur, one's the technician, one's the manager. And when they get to the office, they're always having an argument. Every day they're having an argument. The manager doesn't want to be, be, uh, uh, be in a position where he's got, he's got to wrestle in the, uh, the entrepreneur. Entrepreneur wants to see the vision. He's the pioneer. He wants to disrupt. He wants to dominate, right? But he's, being ups he's upset because he feels he's being controlled by the manager. And then technicians say, listen, man, I'm about r and I'm about to research this product. I'm about to develop this product. I'm about to innovate this product. I'm about to disrupt the industry. But you're giving me no re resource. You're not giving me a budget. You want to manage me until I can't innovate. So they're arguing all day with one another because everybody has their own desire to advance their department. The technician wants to advance. The manager wants to advance. The entrepreneur wants to advance. Here's the challenge, though. All these three people that show up to the office, guess what? They're the same person. It's the entrepreneur that's trying to manage his company, that's trying to manage the sales force. It's the manager that's trying to manage the technician, that's trying to deal with this entrepreneur. It's the same person. This entrepreneur was a great insurance agent. This entrepreneur was a great chef. Now they're trying to run a restaurant. And this great executive chef realizes there's more to running a restaurant than creating a great plate of food. And he wants to grow and expand, or he may not know how to grow and expand outside of him cooking a great plate of food. And the manager's frustrated because they can't get the right staff because there's not enough revenue coming to the business. All these three people are fighting. And what's, what's the point? If you read the book, The e -Myth, the point is that most business owners work in their business than on their business. You cannot see the picture where you're inside the frame. Here's why. As you're starting off your, your business as an entrepreneur or you're scaling to the next level, many entrepreneurs don't want to learn because control. Have you heard that statement? If you want to do it right, do it yourself. Eh, that's how broke people think. That's how small business people think. That's how small thinkers think. Well, that means I got to, if I want to do it right, I got to mow my own lawn. I got to change my own. Oh, no, I got to do, do everything. No, you're supposed to grow the business. You're supposed to grow and increase your capacity. You're supposed to expand your bandwidth. You can't do that by dealing with mowing the lawn, by changing your own oil, by dropping off your dry clean, by 
doing the laundry and, and folding your clothes. You can't do that. You need to be an entrepreneur to do what? To create jobs. So therefore, you can hire people that do that for you. And if you're looking at working on the business, people who are exceptionally good in business are so because of the insatiable need to know more. That's how it was when I was in insurance business. I want to know more about the annuities. I want to know more about IULs. I want to know more about infinite banking. I want to know about et cetera, et cetera, right? And I couldn't just relinquish control to anybody else. I need to go out there and do all the appointments and all the illustration proposals. Couldn't relinquish that to a junior advisor. Couldn't delegate it to a team member. That would grow and mentor and coach and build up. I couldn't do that because I need it done now. And I'm the best one to do it. The other part about the book, The E-Myth, is that sometimes entrepreneurs is understanding the technical work of a business does not mean you understand a business that does the technical work. It's right there from the book. And when you're looking at the business, growing a business has less to do with the technicalities of the business. I talk to insurance agents all the time. They get hung up on one thing, selling the right insurance policy, selling the right insurance policy, right insurance policy. But they don't understand how to grow a business. And they think they know how to grow a business. Great insurance agent, though. Phenomenal insurance agent. But they don't know how to grow a business. Worse, they don't know how to delegate and inspire and encourage and develop other people. And they think that just because they got a great PowerPoint, they got a great sales system, they got a great lead system, that's sales management. Yeah, that's sales management. That's not sales leadership. When you want to invest in people and get them to grow and see more in them than they see in themselves, and what is leadership? You know, J- John Maxwell says leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. Those are his words. I'll add, to, I'll, add, I'll add to my own definition. I believe leadership is helping people do things they would otherwise not have done themselves if left to their own devices. So my job as a leader is to get people to get out of their comfort zone, to get people to see their life by having a 360 view on what they're doing, to see themselves in the movie. It's my job as a sales leader. And are you the one yelling at yourself? If you're watching your own movie, are you yelling at yourself and throwing popcorn at the screen? So that's what my job is as a sales leader to get people to the next level. So uh, that being said, here's some uh, videos here that my team wanted me to react to um, about entrepreneurship. Let's take, a, let's take a look at the first video. Inability to manage time is just inability to manage ourselves. People get into business because they want to have freedom. The irony of that is that freedom comes from discipline. And so a lot of people still remain in this like reactive state, but because of that, the business suffers from results. So in order to manage your time, you actually have to manage yourself, which comes from discipline. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing about entrepreneurship. People want the lifestyle. People want the money. People want the freedom. But guess what you need? There's a common denominator to experiencing all that in terms of growing your business. It is discipline. Proverbs 29, verse 17. Discipline your son and he will give you rest. He will give you delight to your heart. What happens if you don't discipline your son? If you don't discipline your children, they're going to give you grief of your heart, not delight. Say, well, by the way, what is your baby if you don't have children? What is your baby for most people? This is their business. It's their investments. If you don't discipline your business, you don't discipline your investments, you'll either have delight or you're going to have grief. Let's take a look at the other video. Skills are the only thing that we'll always appreciate in time and work in compound compound in concert. So when they work together, if you know how to do math, then you can learn how to do accounting. If you learn how to do accounting, you can learn how to do tax work. If you learn how to do tax work, you can figure out how to insurance works. If you're insurance works, then you all of a sudden you're a CFO and you can prepare companies for sale. Like the skills stack on top of each other. That specialized skills are valuable independent of the currency or the economic climate. And so if you are good, you will always have a place to provide value because people want good stuff. Prices may vary, currencies may vary, but people will want the things you have if you are good. That's true. I mean, the, the staff I hire, if they're not good at social media, if they're not good at production, they're not good at uh, copyright, they're not good at some of the things we're talking about, they're not good at cop- uh, captions and, and good at uh, chopping editing video to get my story out there right, they're, they're done. So here's another thing too as well. A lot of people, they do acquire skill, but unless they have desire to get to the next level, they're going to stay at that current level. How many people have you seen, you know, they're making 70, 80,000 a year, 30,000 a year. They're good at one thing, one good skill set, but they don't add on to it. So if you want to get ahead, if you want to be part of the seven-figure squad, guess what you have to do? This is great advice because you just can't do one thing and just stay there. Because how you do one thing is how you do everything. If you constantly are growing and compounding in different areas of life, faith, finance, fitness, sales, sales leadership, if you're constantly compounding and disciplining those areas, you will build because you won't be satisfied. 
You're wanting to know more. Your business starts to grow. The people are saying, listen, I want to get paid more, but guess what you got to do as an entrepreneur? You got to increase the revenue of the company so therefore you can pay your people more. So you got a job out there, go out and do some business development, create some new relationships, shake some hands, close some contracts, so therefore you can grow the bandwidth and the revenue of the company. Your EBITDA is a lot higher. Guess what? You can pay more people. You can recruit more staff. You can hire C-level players to become B-level players. B-level players to become A-level players <laughs> if it's in a disposition to grow. Or outright just hire an A-level player. So these are areas here that you can grow in your business because we are at, I don't care where people are at. All I care about is where people are headed. That to me determines whether or not somebody's going to be living in business, thriving in business, or just surviving. All right, let's take a look at this other one, this other category here about faith and finance. So here's the thing with faith. All I do, the fundamental foundation of what I do, I've learned this in my 30s. And guys, I spent 10 years of my life making mistakes. I spent 10 years of my life in family corporate. I spent 10 years of my life in bankruptcy. And here's the one thing that I realized. Here's the one thing I realized. If I didn't have this even if I rebuilt it all over again, I would eventually lose if even I was going to rebuild if I don't have this one thing. And what is that? That's faith. Faith. I wrote a book about it. It's called Faith Made Millionaire. I don't credit to what I do because of me, even my team. I'm not self-made. I'm not even teammate, even though that's great. Even a team over self, but it was over us. And the whole evolution of our process is faith. Faith made us. Instead of fake it to make it, I faith it to make it. And faith is a blueprint. When you look at this book, when I see 6,000 years of human history inside this manual, inside this book, and the Bible, this is why I look at the Bible. It's just not a bunch of hymns and a bunch of boring scriptures. To me, this is a blueprint to how to go through some of the worst things about what a human being goes through and how to come out on the other side blessed, squared away, and being a blessing to other people. But it is the blueprint for me to guide my decisions through wisdom and discernment. And what is wisdom? Here, here's, here's what I'll share about this. Wisdom to me is not just knowledge. I run across a lot of knowledgeable people all the time. College degree, master's degree, PhD, but zero common sense. Zero world experience. Zero done it themselves. And yet they want to counsel me just because they read about it in a book. That because they think they're more credentialed or qualified than me because they have a piece of paper that proves it because they put $100,000 into their college education and that justifies why their perspective is much richer and read up and a better viewpoint than mine who's a kid from Chicago with a 2.2 GPA, with eight years in the Marines, 25 years of experience dealing with people, building a $40 million top line revenue top company. You don't think that has some form of parallel value to as well outside of just an academic degree in academic education. So when I look at somebody with education, I ask the next question is who have you learned from that actually is in the grind with practical experience and actually doing it? Because the key word there is experience. If you can combine education, academia with experience, woo, now you got wisdom. And sometimes you don't need to necessarily be in academia to be educated. But if you're educated, whether through academia or street smarts with experience, boom, that's wisdom to me. So when you're looking at that blueprint, here's some videos here, we'll have some reaction on, on what that is all about. Let's take a look at this. What's your thoughts on faith and how does a man build his faith? You don't have to build it, you have to understand you were born with it. I'm not talking about your religion, I'm talking about your faith. We both share, you know, we're both Christians, I know, I know, but I don't tell people what to believe. So without faith, we don't function. But faith is a muscle. And the more you use a muscle, the stronger it gets. Amen. Faith unused does not grow, it shrinks. Courage unused does not grow, it shrinks. Passion unexpressed does not grow, it shrinks. So, but if you use more of it and you rely on it more, you discover it's there. By the way, if the, the more you're skeptical, the more you're cynical, the more you look at the world in a negative way, that grows too. So when you're looking at your faith, you can either feed your fears all day, and guess what? That grows, and what a strong monster that is. I would even argue that fear is a much better recruiter than faith. I would say that anger, and I'm going to do me, I'm going to be isolated, I'm going to be stuck in my man cave, is a much more attractive proposition 
than getting out of your shell, transforming, being vulnerable, being worked on, being honed on in faith. Think about this. Why do you think they call it the 1%? Why do you think they call it the top 5%? Why do you think they call it the top 10%? Because they're doing what the other 90% is not doing. So having money, having faith, being in business, we are the minority of the world. And guess what? There are more people that are going to troll you, hate on you, doubt you at every different level of your growth than people encouraging you, praising you, recognizing you for the things that you're doing. Sadly, that's part of life. Now, do you want a solution, though, to not get hate, to not get trolls, to not get doubters? Here's a solution. Ready? Here it goes. Do nothing. Do absolutely nothing with your life. Don't do anything to advance. Don't do anything to grow. Don't do anything to improve because you make everybody around you so comfortable you're around you. But if you're the person in your family and friends, your, your network. So by the way, if you haven't found your network to be increasing your net worth, guess what you got to do? You got to be that person that you are valuable to have people around you, that you're growing. And you when you plug into circles of people that are much richer than you, they want to encourage you to get to the next level. Because guess what I've recognized getting to the next level, for the most part, is that when you get to the next level, seven-figure status, eight-figure status, nine-figure status, this is rare air up here, right? Is that there's more people actually silently recognizing you and encouraging along the way than people doubting you. Because they too went through it. That's right. They too went through it. They respect you and give you, did you give you the, the honor of getting to the next level to encourage you along the way and you made it? Man, respect. Nothing but smiles and admiration. When I see my guys win, when I see the people that we coach, the people that we mentor, even though we may be in the same industry, even literally in the same company, I love seeing people win. The joy that people have in their heart for winning to get level because they followed their faith and at the same time to see what God did with them in their life, to see what type of revenue they created in their business, to create more jobs, that God used them to them and through them to bless other people, that they can pay their rent, they can send the kids to college, they can put food on the table because that person followed in faith and everybody around them is blessed because that man or woman that followed in faith to establish that company, that initiative, that movement, that church, that sports team, etc., because they followed in faith. Let's take a look at this end clip. If your Christianity is nothing more than an insurance plan for the afterlife, that is not a conversion. That is not legitimate Christianity. If you're like, hey, I went on Easter, I raised my hand, just in case the Christian thing is right, <laughs> I'm going to heaven because I did the thing and I signed the piece of paper. That is an insult to God. And your heart's not in the right place. It, it's not. It's you acting as if God is there like blue cross and blue shield in case you have a broken leg. 100%. <laughs> and then you'll never be disciplined by God if you view it in a legalistic way because you think that it's laws and that you have to, whereas it should be because you want to and you want no, to that, please that, that's, God. That's exactly right. By the way, I used God not only in that way, but I used God in Christianity as a piece of body armor. I wrote about it in my book here, Faith Made Millionaire, that as I was affixed my body armor, first class uh, 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 Petty Officer Johnson and second class Petty Officer Brother White approached me in their Navy dungarees. And if you know this thing about the Navy and the Marines on the Navy ship, it's kind of like, hey, 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 CB, hey, squid, don't talk to me. <laughs> hey, shipmate, don't talk to me. I'm a Marine. Anyway, we're about to launch into Somali Africa. We're launching at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in, in the morning mission and I'm affixing my body armor to myself and where I'm sitting respected in, in the helicopter because I don't want these guys taking cheap shots in there just shooting me and the worst thing in the scenario I get shot in the behind anyway these guys asked me these two navy shipmen asked me this goes listen marine if you don't come back tonight do you know where you end up I'm like what are you, are you talking about heaven yeah if you're talking about heaven I know where I'm going uh, I think I'm going to heaven if I don't come back Right? These guys looked at me, looked at each other. Listen, if you want to be certain that you're heading to heaven, if you don't come back tonight, we'd like to pray for you. He says, all right, okay. You want to pray for me? Yes, meet us in the ship's library at 7 p.m. tonight, and we'll pray for you. We want you to know that you're going to go to heaven tonight, so please meet us at the ship's library at 7 p.m. tonight after you're all done here, and we'll pray for you. 
I said, no problem. One obligation, though. He says, what's that? Don't tell my fellow Marines. Why? Because I thought that prayer and faith and following Christ was a form of weakness. <laughs> How weird. And so guess what I did? I went down there at 7 p.m. that night, 1900. Went to the ship's library. And guess who I find at the ship's library? Not only do I find Brother White and Brother Johnson, but I find my whole entire platoon down there getting prayed for and singing praises and worshiping the Lord. <laughs> These guys were on a crusade to make sure these Marines of HMM 164, 15 Marine Expeditionary Unit, Expeditionary Unit Battalion Landing Team 29, was prayed for. And they didn't care that they were in Navy uniform. They didn't care that we were Marines. They looked at it as one creature, human being, God's creature, God's creation. And they wanted to make sure our soul, if we didn't come home, would be in heaven that night. And so faith, it's also bold. It's courageous. It's not expecting anybody's opinion on and goes through that opinion. And when you go through scenarios like this and, and you don't use Christ and Christianity as a lottery ticket. So Lord, if you just bless me to win this job, to win this lottery, to win this award, you bless me with this promotion, I promise you, Lord, I promise you I'm gonna come to church on Wednesday. I promise you I'm gonna come to church on Sunday. I promise you I'm gonna be the best Christian ever. It's fake Christianity. In fact, when you're in the worst position, you're actually in the best position. Oftentimes I find myself easy. It's easy to praise. It's easy to worship. It's easy to give. It's easy to donate. It's easy to contribute when times are going right, when things are going well. When you got revenue, your bills are paid, you got money in the bank, your staff is paid, you're dealing with your issues, but more, more so than not, you're happier with your current situations. Easy to praise God. But it's harder to praise God when things aren't going right. You don't feel you have a win. You don't feel you have a victory. People cancel on you. You get a charge back. You get a request for a refund. People quit on you. Boss fires you. Things aren't going your way. What then? What will your faith tell you to do? We'll tell you, nah, this whole faith thing don't work out because I thought it was for God, everything is beautiful and rich and wealthy and right. Is supposed to come in my way. Wrong. It's fake Christianity. It's the wrong way to look at it. You look at God, not only as Charlie Kirk says he's a lottery ticket, or in my case, looked at it as a piece of body armor, or a, or a, let me get past the red velvet rope type thing. Let me get past the bouncer. No. Faith is you following one thing. In my, my life, it's following Christ. It's less of me and more of him. And when you're following your faith in that way where you feel that, hey, Lord, the only reason I'm going to get recognition, the only reason I'm going to get views, the only reason why I'm going to go viral, the only reason I'm going to get a lot of revenue and a lot of business and grow my company and create a lot of jobs because you allowed me to. In the meantime, I'm being a good steward with the talents, the resources, the people, the relationships that you've given me. I'm going to maximize all of that. The vendors, the relationships, the discounts, <laughs> I'm going to maximize all that. Meanwhile, this, this is my prayer, my 50th birthday party. My prayer, my 50th birthday party says, Lord, I pray that you give me courage to help me remove people from the people I don't have the courage to say goodbye to and shake hands with. Help me, Lord, remove those type of people that I don't have the courage to remove myself. Close those doors. If you don't see fit, that I deserve or should earn a relationship with them. I'd like it, but if you don't like it, let it be gone. Let it be closed. Let it be detached in Jesus' name. Flip side, Lord. In return, Lord, with that prayer, I ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you replace them. You replace them with people I'm meant to serve. Please do that. And guess what happened? When I prayed that prayer, <laughs> I prayed that prayer, guess what happened? People left my life. Whether I had boldly said, thank you, man, it's good for this association, it's time for us to go bye-bye, or they just quit on me and they just went away, that happened. Those doors closed. Deals didn't close. Client relationships didn't involve. Prospect relationships stopped calling me back. But guess what in return happened? Weird referrals came in. DMs came in. People showed up in my office looking for me, asking me for name. That's what happened in Flips. Now, I'm not so sure it's going to happen to you because I don't want you to be misconstrued saying, well, Matt, if it happened to Matt, it's going to happen to me. I don't know what God has in store for you. All I know what God does have in store for you is a promise. Is a promise. I can't tell you what that promise is. 
I can tell you that promise is abundance and prosperity. But I do know God is prosperous and God is abundant. So when you're looking at faith and you're looking at him, don't look at the material side of what you can get out of it. Look more so in your faith what you need to give to be aligned with it. Let's take a look at the next clip. How would you feel if you lost it all, but you had the favor of one? I don't care. Oh, I'm good. I, I don't care. Oh. I don't care. Oh, man, what a question you're asking. All the money, all the business, all the... Oh, wait, let me tell you, man. The Yankees, the everything you do, you know, it's changed my life. <sighs> yeah. That's PBD. My team surprised me with that one, man. Because I'm, re I'm reacting to these videos blindly and... Woo! That's PBD. You know, I've been with PBD now going on nine years. He's absolutely changed my life. I can't tell you how many times the favor of God has been bestowed upon his life, the decisions, the directions, the relationships. I've seen Patrick with steam just blown out of his ears, just freaking pissed off. Somebody pissed us off one time at, at one of our big events, one of our con uh, conventions. Teed him off. <laughs> Patrick steaming. Never one day bad mouth anybody. Uh, I've seen people stab Patrick in the back. Never did I see him bad mouth anybody. How many times people stole from Patrick? Never once did he name drop anybody. How many times people did Patrick wrong? Spears, swords, missiles, nukes in his back. Of all the things he did for them, guess what Patrick never came out with? Anger, resentment, retribution. Patrick never retaliated. You know what he, he, he believed in? Him improving, him getting better, and God having the vengeance. And, and our, our logo is, is a hand reaching down and one reaching up because the name of our company is People Helping People. And in June of 2022, while we're in Paris and Monaco, we're getting all the conference calls together because, because Patrick sold the company. Got acquired by Integrity Marketing Group. And we're all calling our guys to make sure their stock, their stock equity is signed, et cetera, et cetera. Patrick made a lot of people happy that day. And the people that did the most to build the company, they're all multi, multi, multi millionaires today has stock ownership of the company, and, and uh, our lives have changed immensely because of Patrick's faith. Started this company with $500,000 of savings inside his life insurance policy, invested into the company, invested into software, invested into office space, invested into payroll, dwindled that down to $15,000. Major, all, all, you know, all shit moment happened on the other side, two breaths away, an insurance carrier cancels the, poly, cancels the carrier relationship with PHP and see the company doesn't have anything to sell. One, 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 uh, one company was remaining. And Patrick had, in faith, flew out to them in Houston. By the way, you guys can read all this book. I'm not sharing some inside stuff that uh, you don't, can't read yourself and uh, uh, choose your next, your next uh, your, um, in his book, um, not choose your enemies wisely, in his book, Your Next Five Moves. And so he writes about all this stuff. I just happened to be around the guy for the last nine years, and matter of fact, my wife and I are in page, I believe, 43 of that book. But to see the hand of God work in Patrick's life, that's my prayer for you as you watch this podcast. It's my prayer for you that you find and discover and prayfully ask and submit to Lord what it is that he's created you for and finding the purpose and the goals, the aspirations that makes him happy. Because when you please your creator, when you please your father, you please... The man upstairs, he cannot resist but to shine down his blessing upon you. And I'm thinking about my relation with my kids. When my kids are aligned with me, my kids are in communication with me, my kids are sharing their thoughts, ideas, and aspirations. We're in, in communication, right? That's our, that's what we need to have in terms of a prayer life with our creator in heaven. When I'm thinking about this type of things, and things are in communication, and things are flowing, and... I find myself as a better father. I find myself as a better entrepreneur. I find myself as a better salesperson, sales leader. I find myself better in a capacity to handle the rigors of entrepreneurship, to handle the rigors of being disciplined with your finance, handle the rigors of being a father, handle the rigors of being a grandfather, handle the rigors of finding out what the next best version of you looks like and how much they can't wait to meet you. 
Can't wait to meet me. And that's my prayer for you. That this week in this podcast, that you find out what God has in store for you. And if you, have find, if you found out what God has in store for you, find out what God has in store for the people around you. Because that's what a leader does. Not only does it look out for yourself, you look out for the people that's around you, that God has placed around you. Tom Ellsworth said something very powerful to me. And I love this quote. My job as a leader is to help you become better after meeting us. In other words, my job is that you're better after us than before we found you. And even if you're quit us, even if you were to leave us, that you're better then than before you met us. And I love that quote. Because I mean, that's an attitude of, ser- of serving you, of helping you, of giving you our very best without expecting anything in return. That there's no quid pro quo. What's that fancy word? Quid pro quo relationship here. The only reason I'm going to give you because I know you're going to give me. Now, for me, and something to consider you do on your own, is to give without the expectation of receiving anything in return. When somebody gives you something back in return, you're surprised. But your job is to give and to be a wise steward of the talents, the gifts, and the resources sent your way. So that being said, guys, uh, we expect more of this content here on a week-to-week basis. Are we going to do a lot more interviews? What interview? Who would you like for me to bring on as an interview on our 7 Fear Squad podcast? Meanwhile, you agree with me, you don't agree with me, please put it in the comment section below. I've got a lot of exciting things that happen here. I've got a lot of exciting things to share with you, what's happening in our career, in our business, in our relationships. Uh, we'll be in Las Vegas here August 5th through the 9th for our annual convention called Game Time, PHP Game Time. Uh, very excited for that. we got Bill Belichick coming out. we got Ludacris coming out. we got Patrick Lencioni coming out. we got obviously Patrick David coming out. So very excited about that. So with that being said, everybody, hit the subscribe button, hit like, drop your comments, and uh, until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. Bye-bye. See you next week.